It's the second panel now uh, at our Sustainable Material Day. And we have again uh, one speaker less this afternoon, but a lot of experts here on stage. I will call them now one by one. And then they will introduce themselves and then we get the discussion going um, as before. So, first speaker and first guest is uh, Santino Wist, researcher at the University of Aachen, just uh, around the corner here, probably 60, 70 kilometers. Welcome, Santino. Good afternoon. Yeah, we sit, we have one woman, she sits in the middle, and this one is my seat. So, you, you have free choice, nearly. Um, Paolo Dassi. Marine and Industry Manager at Bcomp. Good afternoon, Paolo. Hello. Welcome. Next guest uh, as well from Italy, Fabio Bigliolini, COO Northern Light Composites. Hello. Good afternoon, hello. Then um, Friedrich Daimann, founder at Greenboats. We heard already a lot about his company, but he was not here. Um, <laughs> welcome, Friedrich. Thank you, welcome. Then Elke de Meyer, research scientist at Saint Textbell. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You know already your seat; it's <laughs> in the middle. And um, Thomas Wegmann, marketing manager at the European Composites Industry Association. He was already here this morning. Thomas has a lot to say. Thank you. Very good that you are here again. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so. Um, we had a good experience uh, the last days. Um, if everybody introduces him herself, uh, describes a bit the role in the company and the role of the company and why uh, she, he is sitting, sitting here on stage. So, um, ladies first. Uh, she was afraid sitting next to Friedrich, but she was <laughs> yeah. much taller. But now <laughs> it's nearly the same, really. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Okay. So, uh, Elke, uh, welcome. Okay, so I am, I'm Elke de Meer. I work at Centex Bell, so we are a research organization in Belgium focusing on textiles and um, plastic materials. Um, so we have like a really broad range of um, investigation and, and research we're doing, going from, let's say, the mount masks that are really popular right now. Uh, we did a lot of testing on those. Um, we have a um, department that is focusing on, for instance, the production of yarns for clothing, but at the same time also for um, knitting and sewing in, um, when you have surgery, for instance. And then uh, the department I'm working in is more focusing on the composite materials. Uh, my colleague is more focusing on the thermal set materials, and then I'm more focusing on thermoplastics, both fiber reinforced as well as self reinforced materials. And I'm here um, since I'm working on the CBiocom project, which is a project that is about the development of bio based thermoplastic composites for marine um, environments. So mm -hmm. that's me. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, then I go just through my list here. Santino, welcome. Uh, nice for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Santino. I work for <laughs> the at, um, our Research Institute of the University um, in Aachen. We our name is the Textile Technology, and um, we do everything that has to do with textiles, from the fiber to a product, and of course that also includes um, composite materials. Uh, our own, I think, um, the sound sometimes. sometimes in and out, but I think it's okay now. Maybe I'm sitting on it. Um, well, we, we have a, our own um, carbon fiber production too, and we also weave. We don't make our own natural fibers, but we do weaving and l uh, layups of them. And we do everything in the process chain from, well, the fiber until... Okay. Is this better? Or is this double? Okay. Um, we do everything, yeah, from the fiber until the finished product there. My department itself is the composite production department, so we do everything from a semi-finished product to the finished one. It can be a uh, thermal set or a thermal plus route. Both of those would work. Um, we are lots of researchers. I'm just one of, I think, 110 people doing their PhD at my institute at the moment. Um, we do lots of different fields, but my field is the, the natural fibers and um, seeing what we can, what kind of applications we can qualify them for and seeing if they're actually sustainable in those applications. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Paolo? Yeah, 
good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paolo Dassi. I am uh, the marine and industry manager at Bcomp. Uh, Bcomp is a Swiss company working in the development uh, of flux fiber-based yarns and fabrics. And uh, everything we do at Bcomp is uh, aimed to be used uh, in composite materials. So we are not coming from the from the textile industry in terms of garment or or clothing. And this is quite important because the, our mindset is uh, uh, towards the application of the material with the resin and so to optimize the strength, the stiffness, and especially the consistency of the properties uh, across the production. Bcomp is uh, 12 years old now, and since the very beginning, uh, flux was the material of choice. Uh, in the beginning, applied to sports goods, like uh, skis or tennis rackets, and uh, suddenly developing into more, a much more broader application, like uh, motorsports, automotive, uh, marine, of course, and that's why uh, I'm sitting here and um, aerospace and rail, now that we have also a solution that uh, complies with the fire retardant requirements of these industries, which are pretty tough. Mm -hmm. uh, Bcomp, uh, despite being a production company nowadays, uh, has a very strong uh, uh, R&D mindset. And uh, just to give you an idea, about 40% of our uh, workforce is uh, uh, busy in uh, R&D and technical support activities. So even though the, the production part of the, of the company is now probably the, the bigger one, we are still uh, very much looking at uh, enhancing, the, enhancing the material properties and uh, understanding the processes and uh, the application of our materials better and better. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Fabio? Hi, everybody. I'm Fabio from uh, Northern Light Composite. Uh, we are a startup from Italy. We are working to solve the problem of end of life of uh, Boat. Uh, we are uh, working in three years on a new composite uh, that is based on uh, thermoplastic uh, resins and uh, a natural fiber uh, or recycled fiber mainly, but also traditional fiber because uh, the resin is the real uh, uh, innovative solution because it's recyclable in an easy way as uh, Arkema uh, was talking in the previous uh, uh, speech. Uh, we uh, are passionate sailors, so we start with uh, sailing boats. Uh, we start to build uh, dinghies. Uh, we switch then uh, to a sport boat. It's a seven meter and a half boat that is uh, now sailing. It's full uh, thermoplastic with uh, flux fibers and basalt fiber for uh, the structural uh, field. Um, the boat was uh, uh, winning uh, Italian championship uh, last year to prove that uh, it's not only sustainable but also performance, also light. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we was lucky to win the European uh, Boat of the Year World uh, on Saturday year at, at the boat. Okay, yeah, very good. Thank you very much. And Friedrich? Yeah, my name is Friedrich Daimann. I'm the founder of the company Green Boats. I'm a boat builder in profession and um, uh, I founded the company in 2013 and it pretty much all, was all about um, the, yeah, the material they, they, who are yeah, like, yeah, common in the boating industries. So I didn't like to work with them and I did a lot of research to replace the uh, synthetic materials. Um, to have, uh, but still have the same performance as an like glass fiber uh, uh, composite, and um, we building a lot of different projects. We do a lot of research projects. Um, we um, yeah have yeah a, a boat production. Um, we have a stand as well, like here in um, hall um, 16. And uh, we built like a beautiful day sailor, um, and um, but we turn more and more into a um, technology company uh, because we see just such a yeah huge demand um, in um, a really wide or wider industry just than just the boating in industry. Um, in yeah, sustainable solutions, um, yeah, like panel materials and 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 stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we you you brought some examples. We we have a look at at them later. Uh, uh, Thomas, 
is really an expert in, I mean, all of... Everything, all of the above. <laughs> no, <laughs> not really. Uh, so I'm, my name is uh, Thomas Weckman. I'm a marketing manager at uh, AOC, a resin company. Uh, we are supplying uh, different, uh, different types of resins uh, to uh, well, multiple applications, including many boats and uh, many boat builders uh, we are supplying. Um, I, I'm, I'm having two hats here. Uh, one is that I, I can talk about resins and, and what's happening there, but also I'm a member of the Working Group Sustainability at uh, UCI. Uh, the European Composites Industry Association, and from from two sides, uh, we we are trying to, well, develop more sustainable production technologies, products, and and and, and resins, as well as trying to promote uh, recycling and uh, composites end of end of life waste management. Uh, those those kind of the things we're working on as a, as an organization. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So this uh, this panel is a bit more about inspiration. This morning we had a discussion, um, okay, what to do with all the GRP boats yeah, that are out there. I mean, 6.5 million, probably 7.5 million, 8 point, we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, what to do with them when they reach their end of life. Um, which material is the best alternative? Is it carbon? Is it flax? Is it absolutely something else? Well, I'm not an expert, but we have uh, all of you here. What do you think? What will be the material that, you know, kicks off? Um, I would say it's um, it really depends on, on your product. You can't say it, like, straight away. I think there are a lot of applications where we co can go to, like, 100% bio-based uh, solutions. Um, but on some some components, we exactly we we we've built a lot of uh, components for uh, Team Alicia Borussemann Racing, and um, for sure you won't be able to build uh, the structure of a foil and and stuff like that with with natural fiber, because it's just like so high loaded parts. Um, but you can for sure replace a lot of different stuff with the uh, with the natural fiber. So. I think it's always like a, a combination um, of, of materials as well, like in the, in the core. It just, um, yeah, you, c you don't have a really like straight an answer for, for, for that. Yeah. Uh, okay, but what uh, you are using flex a lot, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Boris is using some components, uh, I don't know, 100, 200 kilos, I think, of, of flex on his boat. Um, can you do a whole hull and deck and all these structures? For example, our day sailor, it's a 27 foot day sailor. We built this one entirely from natural fiber composite, as well as the structure and everything. But um, when you have like crazy stuff like, like these foils and foil boxes and stuff like that, there's just so much load on, on it. And um, for those part, you probably can build it uh, with natural fiber, but it will just end up, yeah, a lot too heavy, and um, and you will need so much material that on one point, is it, mm -hmm. yeah, on a on a certain point, it won't make sense anymore, and probably won't be sustainable. So that is all about uh, yeah the right material in in the, in the right place, and on the day sailor as as, um, as example, we built this one like 10% lighter than a um, glass fiber equivalent, um, and um, but it's all about like technique, knowing your materials, knowing the right process, um, and um, yeah, so that's pretty much. Yeah, Thomas. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, I, I think that uh, if you look at uh, different fibers and fiber systems, uh, I think there's uh, there will be solutions for for many different types of fibers also in the future. Uh, so I think glass fiber will remain there. Uh, that's my. That's, I'm convinced about that, and I think it will bring a lot of uh, benefits uh, for 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 specific constructions. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, for specific applications, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's multiple solutions possible, uh, specifically carbon fibers. If you look at carbon fiber prices, availability, uh, that will be just for very sp specific boats, uh, very specific series. Uh, that it won't, yeah, at the moment, 
Uh, with with the, the current costing, I don't see that as the mainstream reinforcement material for boats. I, I, I think it's, it will be a carbon. specific, specific uh, carbon fiber, yes. What is the problem at the moment for people who, who don't know is it's a... Uh, so, so uh, uh, pff, uh, I don't know exactly uh, what is the, 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 the flex fiber cost, uh, but, but I, I, let's say glass fiber, uh, order of magnitude, two and a half, three euros, four euros, uh, depending on the product. Uh, carbon fiber is more like uh, 20, 25 euros per kilogram. Uh, which has an additional advantage of high strength and high stiffness, of course. Uh, it's, it brings definitely very lightweight composite materials, uh, which is good for, for racing, uh, particularly, uh, and, and high, high speed boats, for sure. Uh, but uh, th that comes at a cost. Uh, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's prohibitive for, for large, uh, in, for deployment in a, in a large part of the, of the marine market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Santino? Yeah, I also agree that sustainability is a very complex topic. So with each application you have, you have to look at the requirements that this application has to solve your problem. And each of these requirements can be solved in a different way to be sustainable in the end. So flax fiber is a great fiber also for the European mar market if it can withhold the strength or if you're unlimited in weight. If it doesn't matter how big the part becomes in the end, then flax is a great option. If it has to be very thin but also withstain a, a high structural load, then it's, it gets more difficult. Also, if you're in a different part of the world, maybe shipping the flax fiber there changes the, the carbon footprint that it leaves in the end. So maybe not flax fiber, but a different kind of natural fiber would be a better solution. And then comes into play, we have some, some matrices manufacturers here too, that when you look at the end of life, what do you actually put that fiber in? So if you use a, a natural based fiber instead of a carbon fiber, but you put it in an epoxy resin, what do you do with it in the end of uh, at the end, and is that still more sustainable than the other than if you put it in maybe a thermoplast? Um, and that makes that makes the question very difficult with each pro product. Mm -hmm. But I think each product has at least a um, yeah an optimized solution to go towards the sustainability, and that's I think mm -hmm. what Greenboat's yeah. doing a lot. Yeah. What uh, what are you doing with carbon fiber at the end? If you if the board is uh, 20, 30 years old, what we talked about this this morning. Actually, the, 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 the commercial process at present is to do a pyrolysis of the, the, the material, uh, which will separate out the carbon fiber, and typically people, uh, so you, you end up with fibers of uh, five, six, 10 centimeters. Typically, those are processed into non-woven materials and, and, and resold for uh, typically composite applications. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that uh, putting on my structural engineering hat, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, this uh, basically is pushing structural engineers to include sustainability in their design. So it means that we are not only looking at uh, strength and stiffness and weight, but we should add this additional uh, variable, which is uh, sustainability. And uh, probably the, the example Frederick just uh, made is, uh, I think, is very, very helpful to understand that uh, a day sailor, 8 meter, 10 meter, can be fully built out of uh, natural fibers, no problems. Definitely, definitely, if we step up in size, in the same way we are not using glass but carbon, uh, this is a reason, there is a reason for that, because stiffness of glass is not enough uh, to withstand the loads uh, with the limited deflection. And, and it's very heavy. And it's very heavy. And this is in the same way we probably cannot use flux to make a foil, a mast, uh, or th those kind of objects. Mm -hmm. and, uh, in the, in the racing scene, it's uh, even more difficult because, of course, racing means uh, speed, which means lightweight. It's, a, it's an equation, I would say. And uh, even though some parts could be built out of, uh, for example, flux fibers, uh, they would result in a heavier part compared to carbon. And this is something that, of course, a, a racing team cannot, uh, cannot withstand if the rules are not um, uh, sort of... Uh, uh, giving him some advantage on this side. And just to make a parallel with the, what is happening in the motorsport industry, uh, we recently built um, with one of our clients uh, a nose cone of a formula car that uh, uh, is usually built out of carbon fiber. We built it in flux, uh, and uh, it underwent the same crash test that uh, the FIA requires for formula cars, mm -hmm. and it actually passed it, but the weight penalty was about 30 kilos. So again, we can make it something strong enough. Yes, we can. Even though the, the performance required are very high, there is a small penalty weight in this case. 
So I, I agree that uh, the, the problem needs to be looked at in a holistic way, taking into account all the considerations and uh, what the, the performance required are. Okay, this is, uh, I mean, very high-end uh, uh, yeah. application. Yeah, uh, but Frederick, you wanted to I think a similar topic we've got um, on the Emocas. Like when we build components for them, um, we really need it to be the same weight like a carbon fiber equivalent material. And that's just like really hard to, to get these properties. But for the non-structural parts, there are like um, escape hatch and, and uh, floor panels and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They still have like non-structural escape hatch. These sides needs, needs to withstand uh, two tons of load. So it's somehow structure. But um, um, you can manage to do that when you do, or you have like all the data of the materials, you can really manage to do um, the fi fiber layup in, in a way that you are able to get um, or to withstand the same load mm -hmm. and still uh, be in the same weight as the carbon fiber parts. It for sure needs a bit more engineering, um, but um, it's, it's totally possible. Mm -hmm. And um, for the es escape hatch, uh, as example, we ended up with uh, um, a bit more deflection like two millimeters more deflection, but uh, yeah, it doesn't ma doesn't matter at all. So yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah okay. Um, so flex <coughs> seems to be one of the materials. What else is out there? Maybe um, Elke, because she is, has a good overview and um, researching a lot of uh, stuff, I guess. Well, I, I think it's not only the fiber itself. Since we're still talking about composites, you also need to look at the matrix material. And, and there you need to think, is it a thermoset or a thermoplast I need? And then you can think of end of life with a thermoset material. As far as I'm aware, recycling is still really difficult. Um, while with a thermoplast, you can remeld it and you can have a new composite structure again. Um, that might also be interesting again. But then if you want to combine it with a flex fiber, that starts to degrade around 190, 200 degrees, for instance, you're again limited with the kind of thermoplastic polymers you can combine them with. And yeah. um, so I think you need to keep the whole picture from start to end in mind. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, we had a discussion with a company that makes uh, data boys, so it's not really a part of a boat, but it's also in, in the water. And they say yeah, we needed the um, electrical equipment last for one year up to two years, and then they don't even bother to collect the materials again. For that kind of applications, <coughs> we can go to a thermoplast material that is also biodegradable. Mm -hmm. But for a boat that needs to last 40, 50 years, you cannot use the same material. So as mentioned a couple of times, you need to see the whole picture. And I think it will be really um, application dependent on what is the best material you can select. Um, but if you, look, if you have a walk around here and you see all the GRP boards, and I mean, for you, it's like... Uh, History is like 30 years ago, or I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I would not say history, but I think if, if I walk around here, um, the bio based mindset is still limited because you need to reach certain um, demands for your boats, and also price is really important. And I think if I look at the thermoplastic materials, if you can have a polypropylene at one, two euros a kilo, and you have a PLA material at six euros a kilo, we all know what the company will choose. We all know that the customer will not buy something that's 20, 30 times or percent that expensive. Mm -hmm. If we cannot yet prove, it's better. Because that's if, if something needs to last 40 years, we cannot say we put it in the water for two years and it still works. Yeah, okay, but, but, so, but so Fabio will really solve this problem. He is, yeah. Yeah, he yeah, has yeah, yeah. <laughs> correct? <laughs> now, in our vision, thermoplastics is the mm. solution because mm -hmm. we can actually build uh, with our chemo resin uh, a boat that is uh, really performance, really strong enough. Uh, so, Frederick maybe is not uh, uh, in the same opinion, but we are going to thermoplastic. Uh, another topic is that uh, probably another interesting material is uh, recycled carbon. Of course, there is a, 
uh, a recycled carbon mat, but uh, it's coming also the uh, unidirectional fibers. So we can, we can uh, soon uh, build boat with the recycled carbon fibers. That is easier to use. Uh, because, uh, in fact, another question is, uh, is the industry ready to work with flex fiber? Because uh, uh, it's another big topic. Friday is working more than 10 years, but uh, it's not so easy. You, you have to go to see the process, infusion, manual, uh, and the app. Uh, it, it's not so, it's a really big uh, topic. Yeah, the yachting industry, I mean, in my experience, is a bit conservative. So if you, yeah, yeah really conservative. And, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you have now people like Boris proving flex is a good material, and uh, there is one company in Finland, I think, building a, they 50% out of flex fiber. Yeah? Is the racing. Baltic yachts. Yeah, yes. Baltic yachts. So, and, and there are others uh, using it. Um, then people will be convinced. Huh? But um, I, I think we, we should also take lessons from other fields as well. So not only focusing on uh, on our marine uh, industry, mm -hmm. uh, because in, in a lot of other uh, applications, uh, flux is indeed used. But I'm, I'm talking about flux, but um, also thermoplastics. I mean, all the different options to make up a, a composite material, like in the automotive, uh, not even motorsports. I'm talking high volume automotive, uh, aerospace or rail industry. And so we should sort of uh, take inspirations and also, uh, I would say, comfort from what those industries uh, have done and the, the studies they've done, because typically a, an automotive company can spend much more than uh, a typical yard in R&D. So they have uh, much more data and uh, they, they sort of support their de decisions in a much more uh, rigorous and scientific way. So I think we should uh, take advantage of what uh, others have done. Yeah, and do we need more ambassadors like uh, Boris, for example, or here uh, um, F1 team? Um, is this your marketing, uh, uh, Thomas? Is this? I, I, I think there's uh, definitely uh, more ambassadors uh, to that, that show how things could be done. I think that will be very helpful. I, I, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm learning uh, again today uh, about new things and new materials, uh, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I think that... that th if, if I look from a, an industry perspective, uh, there's, uh, I don't think there's one solution that fits all applications. Uh, and I think that's uh, particularly if you look at, uh, at uh, there, is, there, is a, there is definitely a sy material system for smaller boats, larger boats. Uh, there's people that, that make small series, there's people that really make uh, hundreds of boats per year and that have a different mindset. Uh, so there are requirements on, on the design side, um, strength and stiffness. Uh, the requirements on processing, the requirements on, on, on process safety, uh, of, of, of how people work with the materials, and, and all those different elements are, are important. And, and uh, so, uh, from a residence perspective, uh, we can say that uh, uh, we, we work in, in well, first, uh, we, we, if you look at the traditional material systems, uh, polyester boats, and to some extent, uh, vinyl ester resin systems, uh, we, we, we try to make those products greener. Uh, less styrene, uh, less styrene emissions. Uh, uh, make sure that that whenever people use those materials, uh, they know how to work with them, and uh, they they take the right uh, the right uh, precautions uh, to make sure that everything goes well. Um, but uh, going from there, uh, into, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, looking at PET-based resins uh, using recycled PET, uh, looking at bio-based uh, ingredients uh, to make different uh, different resin systems. I think that's definitely def definitely the way to go. Oh. Yeah, okay. and uh, thank you. And uh, Santino, the university here uh, at Aachen is somehow considered as a think tank for the automotive industry. I mean, lots of students are just directly on their way to, to the south of Germany. Um, <laughs> um, what's, what's this up there? Um, can you... Can you what give some ideas? examples? What, what we are researching on or... Um, it's true. First, it's true that lots of students leave directly to the to the automotive industry, and that we also, as an institute, have a lot of contacts with them. Um, they have a lot of regulations, and the regulations are coming 
are going to be even more difficult for the automotive industry. What, like, how much, how much of their weight has to be recyclable afterwards? Mm -hmm. So they're very interested into all of these topics. Um, I talked with BMW just two weeks ago because one of my students now does his thesis with them. And they're very interested in doing interior parts for now out of natural fibers, um, mostly thermoplastic as a resin, because that makes it very easy to, to recycle it at the end and has a very low carbon footprint. So we're trying to do that together with them. Um, but those are not structural parts. Those, they don't have a, have a big load bearing. So they're very, they don't have to have a lot of strength. They only need to. If somebody's angry, maybe if they hit them, they don't break. But it's just interior parts. Um, the load-bearing parts in, in, in the cars, car industry, also very conservative. A either they don't want to tell me because, of course, they're also very secretive. But so far, I haven't heard that they want to make those out of natural fibers. Um, we're trying to do that, though. We're, we're trying to do structural parts out of natural fibers, just like most of, most of you are doing. Um, and depending on the, on the applications, sometimes, I mean, it's always possible to make it. That, I think, is, has been proven. Also, with, with your boat, it's also proven that most sh structural parts can be made out of natural fibers. Um, sometimes in the aero industry, we just made a, a leg for a plane, an ultra-light plane, out of natural fibers. And um, in the end, the process up to making the product is more sustainable than if we would have made it out of carbon fiber. But then over the lifetime of the plane, because the leg was more was heavier, um, the, the carbon dioxide footprint would have been worse if it would have been used. Um, but there we are, the boat industry on one side where weight is not as important, and then the, the aero industry where weight is extremely important on the other side, and the automobile industry is somewhere in the middle, cause, so that could work. Um, other fibers we're looking at is the Jute fiber, uh, hemp fibers, and um, basalt fibers. I'm not sure if that's the correct English word. Um, but, well, Jute and hemp have uh, less... Is less uh, the properties are worse than the than the flax fibers, and the basalt fiber has extreme stiffness, but is very hard to handle. Well, yeah, what what's the problem? Why basalt fiber is, sounds interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's it's if you think about it, it's a little bit like a, a stone. So if if it, it cannot be bent, a carbon fiber is already if you have very small radii that you have to lay, it already breaks, and the basalt fiber is basically that in extreme. So if you want it go in any direction that's not straight, it's going to break in, in production. Afterwards, if you put it in the resin, it's a little bit more flexible, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Friedrich, I want, want to ask uh, one, one thing, because um, your clients, because you have a direct contact with the customer, um, are these people young? I mean, is the mindset different with the younger customers than the older customers? Um, probably not, <laughs> because you need a lot of money to <laughs> buy a boat like this. Um, so they're just like really into this topic. They they have that in in their whole like mindset. They are um, really focused on being sustainable. They probably <coughs> drive electric cars. They um, yeah, just um, maybe yeah, still fresh in their mindset, but. Um, Yeah, not not like um, um, 30 years old or something. Um, that's so it's oh. okay. So their whole lifestyle is yes. already about yeah. uh, sustainable solutions, yeah. yeah, electric cars and and so on. Um, and you founded the company uh, already nearly 10 years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Um, what were your challenges? I mean, using alternative materials. Um, yeah, you probably. You need to, oh, when, I wouldn't, um, um, it's, it's just a lot harder, harder to work with. You need um, a lot of composite know-how and you need to work on a really, on a high level of, of composite. And you probably won't be able to do, to process these materials just um, in a hand, lay, hand layup uh, like a lot of companies still doing um, because you really need to control the uh, resin uptake of the, of the fiber, otherwise you just end up with something but uh, without any nice properties, you have like uh, such a big amount of resin in there. So um, you really need to, to, um, yeah, to be able 
um, to yeah to 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 produce on a on a high level of composite. And um, yeah, that is that is the main thing. Then you you need the properties of the of the fiber, and that's not 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 something standard. You just get on a on a um, yeah on on the internet or something. So you need to do your own testings in your own process, and um, to get the data, to do the um, whole um, uh, engineering of the product, so that you really need your f need uh, know your fiber layup, and um, so that is a quite a yeah, complex uh, process. Um, and then getting the right material as well. Like when I started in 2009, when I started, there were pretty much nothing. It was I, I took like pretty much like blankets from from just the normal like a cotton industry or something, yeah, like a flex fiber industry. But that uh, they didn't had anything uh, to do with uh, like a uh, um, yeah nice performing for performing uh, uh, composite uh, uh, flex fiber. So and you just get. Uh, uh, get some 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 woven materials and um, that developed a lot and uh, there are like more and more suppliers um, who um, yeah offer l nice uh, unidirectional and and um, biaxial materials um, as we know from from the composite industry uh, or where we used to work with in uh, with, with, in, with the glass and and uh, carbon fiber. Um, so that is one thing, and um, yeah, for sure the price. Um, it's more on the level of uh, of the carbon fiber, and um, yeah, then then you really need clients who who pushing that, and um, who want to go this way. Um, but um, yeah, if you don't start, uh, nothing will change, right? So. Yeah, yeah. How did you convince the first customer? I mean, they were not running into your shipyard and say, "Hi, I want a boat." Oh, no, that was something. Yeah, a bit crazy. <laughs> we had a cooperation with uh, Bente Yachts, and they've um, just developed the first one. It was a, a Bente 24, and um, we find the the um, uh, product quite innovative and uh, like the design and and the mindset of the company and um, um, we actually borrowed the mold of them and because we went to them and say okay wouldn't it be nice to have a green version of your product and uh, so we went uh, went to them uh, borrowed the molds and uh, like I went there with the, with the whole team of of, um, of boat builders, and um, but we didn't have a client. We still didn't had had a client before we tried to sell this product. We had a little um, like one to five model of the of the boat, but no one could really realize that that is not just not just a joke or <laughs> something like that. So I just ordered material with a really long payment term, like a three months payment term, <laughs> and I just converted the material into the boat. <laughs> and um, it was pretty much like th uh, three months before boat show in Düsseldorf. And then I, I went with a not finished boat, just the hull and the deck, presented that on the, on the boat show. And luckily, um, I found a client. Um, he was uh, crazy enough to, to continue the way with us. Otherwise, um, we probably, probably were bank bankrupt after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, yeah, you have a picture a of him <laughs> in the shipyard. <laughs> 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 um, is it uh, do, do, do we have to convince the end customer or the or the shipyard? Both, I would say, both because uh, <clears throat> you know uh, shipyards are, uh, as we said before, uh, relatively conservative. And this not, not only applies to fibers, but also if you are changing their process or the resin they're used to use and so on. So it's a matter of uh, making them aware, first of all, of the material, mm -hmm. and then uh, to show them that the material is trustworthy, that we know how to handle it, that now we, we are at the stage where we can suggest it with, no, with, no, with not too many question marks. And then, of course, the end clients, because uh, in the end, they are the ones uh, uh, financing the whole activities of the yards, hours, uh, hours here, and so on. 
So it's a very important part of the of the business. But uh, who could do this? Like uh, an association? I mean, everybody on his own. It's a bit complicated, I guess. But um, well, perhaps two aspects to that. I I think that I, I agree very much with you. It is up to the suppliers as well as to the customers. And I think that the suppliers have to think about okay, how can we make our products greener? How can we add uh, natural ingredients into those products? And how can we think about long term, uh, how we can source those raw materials and make sure that those products are going to be available. Uh, but if, if you put products on the market, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nice that those are green and sustainable, uh, but, but if customers say, well, thank you for, for giving me a green boat, uh, but the other boat costs 20% uh, less, I go for the cheaper one, then at the end, yeah, uh, it's, 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 it's a difficult sell. Uh, so I, I think it's, it's probably a little bit of a combination. Uh, we need to think, okay, what, what are the features and benefits of, of composite materials with, uh, with natural materials, uh, with natural fibers, uh, with, with greener resins. And, 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 and sometimes it is uh, the, the visuals, uh, special visuals that you can get. Sometimes it's a specific performance. Sometimes it is uh, specific parts on a boat that you make and to show, hey, this, it's not the whole boat that is, that is uh, uh, bio-based, uh, but it's, it's, it's half of the boat, uh, but that half of it looks really super fantastic. Uh, so those are then reasons to buy the boat, and in that way you can get something, get something going. I think that Eke, yeah. as a scientist, researcher, is this, was it data, is it arguments, technical stuff they, that will convince? Well, I, I think it really depends because I've been around yesterday and when you see the super yachts, I think it's more aesthetic and showing what you have and I don't really think lots of those customers care about technical parts and, and the properties we can show them. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, uh, they but do. They do. They, I, I think for them, it's, it's, I had a discussion with someone who was like, um, some sort of surfing boards with, with a propeller on there. I don't know how to call it in English. And he also said like for the, the, um, the higher, um, more, more expensive parts they have, they say like the customers only care about their product and not really about the sustainable parts. And there I think mm. most people say, oh yeah, we, we care about the dur durability and stuff, but in the end they just want their products. And I think that's also sometimes difficult um, to, to match with, with the technical part. Also, if, if I start talking about, oh, this is the tensile properties and the bending properties, I think even here in the audience, I will lose certain persons. So I think the, the technical properties are something we should discuss with the, really the, the, the companies that build the boats, but it will not convince the customers to pay 20% more, for instance, if we show them the technical properties. I, I, I very much it's agree here. So actually, the way that we've introduced bio raw materials and bio products is not by necessarily promoting them as bio, but using them to make better products. Yeah. And so we have, uh, uh, just take another example uh, for, from wind energy. Uh, we were able to, uh, to, to we've, we've developed a nice resin to make a blade. Uh, it's 40% bio, uh, but it happens to be better in fatigue resistance, uh, better strength uh, than, than the best available epoxy resin on the market. Uh, so that's, uh, so we, we ultimately will, we will use the green if you want label on it, yes, uh, but, but, but the, way to, the way to get it into the market is performance. It's yes. not performance it's not the and the uh, price is okay then, a yeah. little bit higher. Yes. Yeah? But yes. performance is... Yeah. Uh, um, Fabio, do you, uh, what is your experience? Because you develop a new product and what is your feedback then from, from uh, this industry? Now honestly, I need, uh, we need uh, a new leg legislation to change the market because, of course, if you walk around here, there is a uh, 99% boat uh, built with uh, the cheaper resin, uh, with cheaper materials. So we can make a beautiful boat, uh, we can make a fast boat, but if there is no legislation to help us to push on uh, the market, I think it's really difficult to change it, uh, because uh, it's also not about pri pricing, because uh, boats are expensive, uh, and most of the time, uh, it's not about pricing. It's about uh, probably people don't mind yet uh, enough about uh, end of life. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and, but what I think it's all about is the scale, is, scale as well. 
Like we just like buy uh, rovings from from France and just pr process them in really small uh, small demands into fabrics and stuff like that. So it's all about that. But um, at the end, I think um, when you need ten times as much energy for the production of a carbon fiber, or five times as, as much much energy for the um, glass fiber. Um, at the end, the price of those materials will just like really go up, and um, um, the natural fibers are just like yeah, growing on the acre and have a really a lot smaller CO2 uh, footprint. And um, I, I think um, yeah, that needs to go into the price of the product as well. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Santino, new legislation, or I mean, <coughs> in the automotive, it's uh, very strict huh? I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of, of legislation in these kind of cases um, because sometimes if the market doesn't move and it's a necessary goal then legislation is the only way to get there of course if there's um, let's call them natural or market ways to get the products out there like having a product that is natural based or, or bio based or largely bio based and it has great performance, then that's that's the ideal case. But if um, if it's not possible, I'm also, I mean, in the in the automobile industry, it's the same. They're only interested in finding these recyclable materials now because they have to. Otherwise, they have to pay penalties in the future. That's 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 the way to go in the end. It's a, I mean, that's the way to go in the, in in a capitalist system in the end, because otherwise you're not going to get through with it. But I, yeah. I think I think the carbon footprint. I mean, sustainability as a thing is is very complicated. If you look at it as a whole thing, um, it, like the UN regulation, I think has 17 different sustainability goals. But if we look as a, at a sustainable composite part, um, what, what's really important to us: low CO2 fo footprint of the original material, um, then low CO2 footprint in the production, long life, and recyclability in the end. I think those, if we have all of those four, or at least optimize those four, then we could call it sustain, sustainable. And then, well, those steps are, are hard to, those steps, it's just four, but those, those four are really hard to get. I mean, we can go natural fibers instead of carbon fibers, that's already good. In the first step, then the process of the natural fiber and carbon fiber or processing is similar. But then, then comes the matrix part, which is very important for the, for the recycling in the end. Um, also, your, 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 yours is a thermoplast. Now, how does it come out? In a, in a liquid? Can liquid. you use it for vacuum infusion? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Vacuum infusion technology, the same as an epoxy resin. No problem. So, is that, so, so it's, that, that's how you usually build boats, no? If I'm not mistaken, you use vacuum infusion, no? In, uh, in a big mold. Honestly, yeah. the market is 60%, uh, 70% <laughs> uh, and layup. Okay, a hand layup. Okay, right. But that that would also work with yours, no? Yeah, but yeah. Uh, it's another difficult story to change. Yeah. And legislation again, maybe. Yeah. I think probably an additional topic would be light weighting, uh, not only in the marine industry, but especially in automotive and aerospace, because if you you can have the most sustainable material ever, but if you are adding weight to a car or to a plane, you need more energy, so more emissions to, to move it and multiply it by the 25, 30 years of lifespan of the, of the airplane or car. Of course, you are killing all the uh, green credential you, the material has. Yeah, so I mean, correct. A sailing yacht uh, out of carbon or a GRP. If you have uh, only light wind, you can sail yeah, with the carbon yard with the GRP. Otherwise, you, you start turn on your, so, your yes. diesel engine and off you go. Yeah, um, is a big, big argument, uh, Thomas. You wanted to. Well, I, I, I think that I agree with uh, sustainability and, and those four dimensions. I agree with the weight, but I think there's another important aspect: is the money. <laughs> Somewhere, somebody has to make some money, and so uh, I think that that it's it's definitely interesting to look at at, at uh, products that have a lower footprint, <laughs> uh, but if they are twice or three times as expensive, uh, then it, and it's not going to work. And I, and I think that in, if you make a boat on a, on a, in a series, on a series basis, uh, you, you need to think about uh, uh, every day, uh, the, the performance that you, that you try to achieve, you need to be able to, to get it from your process. 
So there has to be some kind of a robustness of the process, uh, which means uh, some kind of a, a, a consistency in the fiber, consistency in the resin, a consistency in the, in the process steps, uh, the quality of the people, uh, the quality of the, of the, the, the controls that you have in, in place. And all those things play a role uh, in addition to sustainability and in, in addition to what is it that you want to achieve uh, for, for the specific application. And I think that, that making a, a pleasure boat uh, for, for, for an a, a, a average family is a different thing than making a, a high-speed uh, racing boat that, that has to go around, uh, around uh, the oceans. Yeah, and also in terms of pricing and the economics, we, we should always remember that we are a small industry. I mean, compared to automotive, aerospace, we are really tiny. So uh, I think from our side, we can uh, definitely work in, uh, in bringing the materials forward. But um, I don't think that uh, as an industry, we can uh, make any, let's say, revolution on the pricing. So the big, big volumes, like really big volumes are coming from... Uh, uh, the wind turbines, uh, wind turbine blades, uh, the automotive industry, the aerospace industry, and that's uh, what could help uh, to optimize the manufacturing process, for example, of flux fibers and the materials uh, and so on. So I think we need, again, to, to seek some help uh, also from other, other industries. Mm -hmm. So uh, some homework to do, but uh, we are already on the way. Is this a conclusion? Because we are coming to an end of this panel. Um, thank you very much. A lot of knowledge here on stage this afternoon. I'm very, very happy that you have been all here. Thank you very much. Thank you.